Welcome to Season 2 of Time and Materials, a construction-only podcast powered by LiveCost.com, where we sit down with interesting people doing interesting things in construction. These construction experts kindly give us their time so that you can walk away with the tools to make better day-to-day decisions in your construction career. Well, you're very welcome to another episode of the Time and Materials podcast. So this week, we are joined by Jerry McKay, and this is an interesting one. So Jerry's background is, I mean, you talk about modern methods of construction and um, modular building, offsite building, and a lot of people, that they're, they're new terms. Jerry's background and his father is actually claiming that we have, you know, the first to actually build the, in- the industry, so the first Irish modular construction company. So Jerry shares that story of him and his father getting involved in that company and eventually creating that which spun into century homes which had a significant exit to kingspan so we share a lot of that um, we also jump into a lot of the problems and the reasons i suppose that modular isn't mainstream and jerry's thoughts on that and how he's such an advocate for that going forward so we dig into a lot of problems a lot of issues and we, we get jerry's thoughts on a lot of those uh, cutting problems that are, that are challenging construction across the board not just here in ireland but in the uk and in certainly in the US where Jerry's based. So sit back, enjoy, and I hope you get some value from my chat with Jerry McCauley of Integra. Jerry, you're very welcome to the Time and Materials podcast. Thanks very much for coming on. Thanks very much, Kieran. Um, it's eight o'clock here in the morning in a, in a beautiful sunny Los Angeles. Yeah, I'm not sure. Not quite sure what the weather is like over where you are. And if I remember correctly, it's probably raining. It's cold. It's cold at the moment. Cold. Yeah, cold and fresh. So, uh, we're uh, I walked up the keys here. We're recording here just in the back of Peel Street here, and I'm, I walked up the keys there, and that wind that comes in across Dublin, take you know that yeah. north facing wind that comes in across your face. That, yeah, that's yeah. called the, the lazy wind. It doesn't go. Th- it, it, it won't go around you. It just goes through you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, it's cold. It's fresh. Um, I'm sure we didn't get you up up out of, out of your bed at eight a.m. I'm, I'm sure you, you're 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 up, but we do appreciate you coming on. We we know you're a busy man. Um, usually with this stuff, Jerry, we usually ask most people come on about like their own background and um you know where their story starts but if you don't if you don't mind i wouldn't mind going back just a further step in, in, into your, your dad um so yeah. just been doing a bit of research and looking at his impact on you and, and your industry would you mind like telling us a bit about your dad and his his story no, absolutely not i mean he he is i suppose i mean i have a nickname over here in the u.s as mr offsite but in, in reality my dad brian mckay was not was is I know he's passed about two years ago now, but he he was really the pioneer of timber frame stroke off, now called offsite construction in Britain and Ireland. I mean, he left he left he he was a carpenter. He was a he was a finished carpenter, and he was a roofer. <laughs> Back in those days, that that's that's what he did. Mm-hmm. He used to always tell me that you know he he could he could hang more doors in a day than any other carpenter he ever met. That was his measure of a of a good carpenter. If you could hang a door properly. And the amount of them you could hang in a day that that's how he determined how good how good or bad that you were as a carpenter but he he, he uh, emigrated to the u.s to new york in uh, the late 50s and you know obviously back then every single house back then in ireland was built out of concrete blocks that was the only way to build so as a carpenter really all you had was finished work and the roof um, in, in the house so he goes to new york and lo and behold discovers um these homes being built out of wood frame now we're over here what they call stick framing, but it's basically it's two by four, two by six studs being framed on a, on the, on the job site. And obviously, as a carpenter, that was something that he could relate to and loved, and you know, really wanted to do. And he spent a couple of years in New York, got married to my to my mom, who he was dating before he went to the U.S., sent the money over to her to fly out. Though he went originally to to the U.S. on a on a boat from out of Cork. Um, he moved back to Ireland in the early '60s, and at that point in time, we were living in the north of Ireland. We were living in, in Dungannon. But he had this idea to, to set up an offsite company, a timber frame company. And just what Americans can't understand is he, it never crossed his mind that he would actually stick frame. He thought, I'll set up a little building here, you know, rent a factory and start making it. And he picked Monaghan Town. And we all we moved to Monaghan in, in, the, in, the late, in, in the early 60s. And he set up the first company there, which was called IJM Timber Engineering, which is, I'm proud to say, is still going today. And um, that effectively, you could say, he, he just didn't start a business. He started an industry because that really was. There was another guy, to be fair, honestly, Morgan McMahon, uh, Super Warm Homes as well. But it, it, 
who's down south who didn't really get the scale that that uh, that IJM got to, and it, you know, by by 1985, my my dad had that business was now the largest timber frame company on these islands in Britain, in Britain and Ireland. It was the largest of the whole lot. And uh, then during that period, and I can jump ahead a little bit. I mean, in, during that period of time, I was I I went to college. I went to U, to, to UCD, and uh, I I did marketing and. When I was there, I, I had to write, you know, a report to get my degree. I had to write a report on very on whatever the topics I was, uh, the, the class I was taking, which was primarily marketing based and and uh, and international inter, international marketing. And I, I decided to write reports on the offsite timber frame industry because nothing more than than my dad was in it. I it wasn't because I particularly had any knowledge or interest in it. In fact, I, at that point in time, I didn't even know that there was any difference between. Uh, it was sorry, I shouldn't say at that point. It was only early, slightly early, because I actually became aware that there was any difference between the houses that my dad was building and the way other houses were built. I didn't know because that's all I had ever experienced. And when I discovered that there was a difference, I wrote this report um, that basically highlighted how you could build a significant offsite business in Ireland that could go international. And that when when I did that with a, with a group of other guys, three other guys, and we actually got first in the class for that report. But my at that point in time, my dad sold out. They, they, he ended up falling out, to be honest, uh, in the business. He, he sold out his share of that business and was deciding what he wanted to do. I had graduated from, from uh, UCD, and I, I went out to live in California, ironically where I am now, but I went out there with a bunch of other guys out of the class. And when I was out there, and I was there for nearly four years, my dad phoned me one day, and he, and he said, uh, "Well, it was this is before cell phones. It was it was one of these reg seg calls we would have on, on at the weekend." And he and he said to me, "Do you remember that report that you wrote in UCD about how to build a international offsite company out of Ireland?" And I said, ah, "Vaguely, I mean, I can, I can not really remember." And he said, did, "Did you believe it?" And I said, "Dad, like I can really hardly remember writing the report, let alone what was in it." I said, but I don't think I ever wrote anything when I was in college that I didn't think was the truth, but that was my frame of reference at the time. And so he sent it to me. And he said, you read that, and if you believe it, put your money where your mouth is. And that's what his exact words said, come back here, and let's have a go at this. And so I read it. He sent it out to me, and I read it. And I left uh, California on December the 3rd, 1989, and we set up Century Homes second timber frame company in Monaghan town on the 1st of January 1990 with myself my brother uh, my dad and, and a gentleman by the name of Jim McBride and lo and behold that company went on to exceed what was in that business plan and become the largest off-site uh, timber frame manufacturer in Europe but actually more than timber frames we were do we were doing six pounds and we were doing light gauge steel and we, and we were like we, we did the world's first six story wood frame building we did the UK's first zero carbon home, which is way ahead of net zero energy, we're doing zero carbon as well. Um, and uh, you know, sorry, not to get too far ahead of this, but that, yeah, my dad was the big influence on in that. I mean, he was the he was the driver, and and the the you know, couldn't done it without him. I mean, his knowledge and experience and understanding of the market and his vision. I mean, that's what I said. When people understand, I mean, you have to go think back to the 1960s that this man thought he was going to convert Irish people from building concrete block houses to timber frame. I mean, he was considered, when I talked about it in 1990, I was considered a lunatic. I mean, to think about what he what must, what people must have thought about him in the construction industry in the early 1960s. I mean, you have to have a very thick skin and be a very far thinking visionary to imagine you could actually do that. And a um, massive belief, I'm sure, in what he was doing was right. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, and, and perfectionist. And, and I would go as far as to say, Kieran, probably, not probably, absolutely the hardest working man I ever met in my life. Absolutely the hardest working man I ever met. Just, he, it was, there's two things, there's only two things that mattered really to my dad. And one of them was his family. And the other was working. That's, that's what he, he went to work and he came home to his family. He never, he never even went down to the pub. Like that wasn't his thing. It wasn't that, he just, he worked, did everything he could for his family. And he uh, and he just and and just believed in what he was doing. And do you remember the like them initial early chats with 
was saying to Jean was like, I'm sure you look at the Irish market and say, well, this isn't going to do. Was it always a grand vision of this has to scale out outside of Ireland? In other words, to have a viable business model, this is going to have to have to get out outside Ireland, or did you look at Ireland as the test bed for something maybe bigger? No, I mean, I, honestly, I the way I looked at it was, and I, I still remember this this part of it, and because it's it's sort of it was embedded in me was when I looked at when I started doing that research in in UCD. What actually came to mind, and I still remember this dawning of this moment when, God, all of these things that all of these people are saying about timber frame housing are actually scientifically not true. And then I said, if that's the case, why is, and, and then I was looking at the advantages. So there was two sides of it. You could look at the advantages that offsite construction, timber frame construction could bring to the industry. And then you were looking at the negatives that people were saying about it. So I kept looking at the negatives and going, okay, let's try and see if these are these are true. So the more I delved into that, the more it became clear to me that scientifically, and I mean it's based on science, scientifically these things are not true. And then I looked at the advantages and I went, my God, this is the way we need to move as a country. Uh, and we're talking now about the time, we're coming up then to the time of the Kyoto Protocol with the CO2 emissions, which we can talk about as well. And I thought, this is the way the industry needs to go. And so I came to this conclusion that the problem with offsite or timber frame construction in Ireland wasn't a problem with the product. The product actually was superior to the way homes were being currently built. The problem was the way it was being marketed. In other words, that the companies that were in the industry didn't know how to get the message across. That that was the that was the dawning, and so that's how, and and maybe because I was doing a marketing degree, I was doing a commerce, but I specialised in marketing. Maybe I would think that, but that's the conclusion that I came to. I said, "There's actually everything's in favour of this industry, just the people who are who are currently in it are not doing a very good job of marketing." And actually, many of them, their view, and I, I I interviewed a lot of them at that time. Many of them, their view was. We, we just keep our heads low because if we raise our heads above the parapet, the concrete industry are going to crucify us. So they were sort of happy to keep at a relatively low level and not wake up the sleeping dog lying in the corner. And that's sort of not in my nature. <laughs> I came the other way about this and said, OK, the facts are the facts. We go at this and we fight this battle out in the open. And then what happened from that was, I, I it, you know, the next move was then to go into the UK and then we started the UK we started looking work further afield and we were going as far as, 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 as Japan and we shipped some houses into, into Europe as well and that's it and then, then we were actually starting to look at uh, expanding into the US before uh, before the company got sold so but it was all based it was all I mean clear on this it was all based on fact it wasn't based on emotion it was actually based on fact and I did a colossal amount of research before I was happy enough to actually say that and the more the more I was digging into it, the more it just my my eyes were opening up, going all this stuff is actually, pardon the pardon the sense, it's all complete rubbish. Mm -hmm. I mean, co literally complete rubbish. And I mean, and, and I've had my battles with the concrete industry in Ireland over you know over the years, and like we used to have these running battles with full page ads in the newspaper because I had no problem going up against them because there wasn't one thing they were saying that was actually actually had a grain of truth in it. So when that's that's. When you sell to, to Kingspan, then was the plan that you would go in and fall in into the into the Kingspan org organization? Was that was that ever, ever, ever on the table, or were you always going to go back and do something yourself? Well, it's like everything. I mean, entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs. They're they're a they're a particular uh, they have a particular mentality. And I suppose when you when you, no, I mean, I've, it's, I mean, Kingspan are a great company, and and I mean, I understood exactly when they. Uh, approach to, to buy it and what they were what they were hoping to do and what they want to do and that. so I have the greatest respect for them as a company and what they have achieved and what Gene Murda has achieved since he took over has been has been incredible but I suppose you know it was a it's just one of those things you're an entrepreneur you, you want to go and do something else and, and the US was always sort of on my radar um, from day one I mean I sort of started out my career after college there came back to Ireland set up Century and it was sort of when we were was when a century was getting sold, we were actually looking at the US anyway. And so it was always sort of in my mind to go back to the US. Was that a personal thing that you just fancied a bit of time out there, or did you see an opportunity within that market for off site? I listen, I, I could give you I mean if I was to go through we we could do a a, a 
10 hour podcast here on the opportunities that exist in the US market for um, the offside industry. And I mean, I even go as far as to say for Irish companies and UK companies that, I mean, I have the height of respect for the, for the, both the UK and Irish timber frame companies that have been around for the last 10, 15, 20 years. And some of those companies have developed incredible technology and they've developed incredible skills of what they do and have, and have been world leaders in what they do. And sometimes they don't realize it. I mean, I see it looking back at them but sometimes they don't realize how good they are. But I would say those companies in this market over here would have a massive opportunity. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers the question, Kieran. But well, the, the you go there, you set up in in, in Integra. So for, for those who don't know, what is Integra? What is it that, that you actually do in there? But it's basically it's basically essentially homes all over again. I mean, we, we but but this time. This time, instead of fighting with the concrete industry, we're fighting with the stick framing industry. So there's always a fight. It seemed to always go to places where there's a where there's a battle to be fought. So this time, so what you do in 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 Europe, you're always fighting the concrete industry with regard to wood frame. So it's the material is the issue. In the United States, it's not the material because 95 percent of the homes are wood frame anyway. What you're fighting is the process, the methodology, because the methodology is on site. So pretty much. As in Ireland, you go out and they put one concrete block on top of another, and it's, it's slow and, and labor intensive, and you know, and and expensive to do. In the U.S., they literally dump the lumber on the job site, start cutting it up, and framing the house or the building out of a set of two D drawings with no technology on the job site, and that that is a huge, huge industry here. I mean, absolutely massive industry, and it's embedded into the into the residential construction sector. And so when those people see you come along with an offsite solution, that's just the same way as the concrete industry sees the timber frame industry in Ireland. They don't want you around them because they think you're taking their work. So you're fighting with them all of the time to get the builders to to see the advantages of the offsite solution versus stick framing. But obviously the stick framers themselves, they control the labor. Who is, so, who is your customer then, Jerry? Is, is your customer the builder? Builder. So when oh, you, same as it was in Ireland, the builder. So when you're so, you're trying to carry and influence the market, are you influencing the end user being the homeowner or the builder? No, the builder. Um, it's it's it's. You'd have to understand the way the way the markets are set up here is completely. I mean, this is not. It's not as easy to do here in terms of influencing the market. Whereas, not, say for example, in Ireland, you can actually do push pull at the same time. In terms of marketing, you can actually go at the builder market and you can go at the consumer because the market's relatively small. And what I mean by small is it's not the number of houses I'm talking about here. It's, it's small in the sense that it's a confined geographic space. And so your marketing, you know, there's four or five national newspapers in Ireland. There's two or three national radio stations. So you can pretty much get your message across to everybody by hitting those limited number of, of resources. You can't do that in the US. There's no, like, there's effectively no national newspaper as such in the US. It's all regional. So even when you're in, the, in California, and let's put this in context, the state of California is the fourth largest economy in the world. It just moved, it's just moved from the fifth to the fourth. So the UK was the, was the fifth, now, 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 now the, um, uh, the U.S. or California was the fifth, and now it's moved to the fourth, and the U.K. has been is behind it. So it's it as a as a state itself is absolutely huge. You have a uh, hundred thousand homes per year being built in the state of California, but you have another equivalent of a hundred thousand, the equivalent of a hundred thousand homes being built in the commercial sector in wood frame in California. So you put that in context, you see that you see the scale of the market. Um, but if you try to influence it. I mean, San, if you look, if you look even at San Francisco, Los Angeles, or San Diego, I mean, you try to you you try to influence one of those markets, you you would you couldn't make enough money in your lifetime to ever be able to to, to publicize yourself enough to try to actually get at the individual buying public. And, the, and honestly, the individual house buyer in, in the United States is not as informed about construction as an Irish person. I mean, the average Irish person, everybody in Ireland, has a family member who's in construction. That's just a simple fact. Like it's just it's a reality. And every single person in Ireland has a family member who's not alone in construction, but is who's got a family member in construction who has worked abroad. 
and we're the Irish are a different breed when it comes to construction. We 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 know it. It's it's innate. Everybody and every family knows something about or somebody in construction. That's not the case over here. Um. So when they, when you go out to buy a house here, they don't. They're they're buying the house more so on the curb appeal. What does it look like and how much does it cost? They don't really know anything else about the the house. So you so really what, hear what our drives, marketing to the builder. What drives the builder then to use? So if the end user, they're not really bothered. They, you know, they're not not looking. It, it, is it a selling point for the builder to be able to say this is going to be built off site, therefore the quality is going to be far superior? Like, is I suppose what what what's in it for the builder? Right. That, well, that's I mean that's the important point. That's that's the starting point of why I got into the business over here was to actually get the builder to think that way was to get the builder to think I can use this one as a selling point and two I can actually use it to build more efficiently and what I mean by that is the expression that's used over here Kieran is cycle time so you don't talk about the length of time it takes to build a house you talk about the cycle time so and it, everything is broken down into a cycle time with the framing in particular is the most important item of cycle time on the job site because just like when you're building houses like concrete blocks, you can't do a thing until the shell of the building is up. You have to be able to get the weather the weather type shell before you can bring any other trade in. So the speed at which you can get the shell erected is extremely important. Now, if you think about using an offsite timber frame solution, oh, sorry, and there's another thing I should actually add into this. So the average size of a first time buyer home in Ireland is approximately 100 square meters. Yeah. Right, 11, 1150 square feet approximately. The average size of a house in the United States is 2,500 square feet. It's two and a half times the size of an Irish house. The starter home, I'm talking about the starter home. Right? Now, so if you think about that, when, when you talk about units, units produced, a, a single house in the United States is equivalent to two and a half units in Ireland. So the framing time is a lot longer because of the size of the house. And they're typically um, not semis. They're typically detached homes, two and a half thousand square feet. They can take anything from 12 to, depending how complex they are, 25 days. And we've been involved in projects that were being stick frame where it was taking the stick framer up to 60 days to frame the homes because they were so complicated. Now, we can come onto that, that job site and take that house through what they call a shear inspection in three to four days so we can knock between anything between 10 12 days on average off the, of a simple house just on cycle time now you multiply that by a builder building 100 or 200 homes on that development in a year that's a lot of days so then what your argument is how much is every one of those days costing you because remember they're paying interest on that they're paying security they're paying overheads there's carrying costs involved with, with with every day that's on that site and the carry cost doesn't stop on a saturday or sunday i mean the bank doesn't stop charging you interest because nobody's working on the job site on saturday or sunday it's still running so every day you can take off that for those builders is significant profit back in their back pockets so what you're looking at and that's so it's down to efficiency so your argument to the builder is we can shorten the cycle time on those homes now in addition to that you're significantly reducing the amount of waste on site. Mm. So typically, there, we, we will save, we will, we will take the number of dumpsters down by at least 50%, if not more than that. So that's, that's again, saving between four and $800 on a job site, depending on where you are, by the fact that there's no, we don't bring waste to the job site. Then you have the quality issues of the, of the framing. Because the framing is all being done on highly automated German or Swedish equipment, the, the, I mean, the quality of the framing that, that the offsite company can produce cannot be matched by on-site or by on-site framing. You just simply can't do it because it would take them twice as long to try to to, to produce to that precision if they if you you know if you if you were trying to match that that they that the that the automation can produce. So you're basically selling to the builder on cycle time, um, quality, and sustainability. Is, um, and is, also is there the a, other no, part a number of units? Certainty. Sorry, Jerry. Is, is is there a number of units where it doesn't become viable? For example, like if if if, if a builder comes to you with, you know, I would imagine the, the smaller it gets, the more difficult it, it, it becomes. Like I'm sure you're not doing one-off custom homes, for example. Um, 
is there is there a point where you you can say listen that's not going to be viable for you yeah i mean t- t- typically typically what what i the view that i've had is if it was if it was less than if really if it was less than f- five homes um we really wouldn't be all that interested in and and if there were five individual homes we, we wouldn't be interested but if there was five coming in or pretty much the same okay at that level we we do it but typically uh, the jobs that, that that i've been involved over here i mean have involved contracts have involved a, usually a minimum of 100 100 plus homes in some cases it's much larger than that but also the one that i didn't mention is multi-family so in, in ireland you know we talk about apartments and we talk about you know homes but you don't but in the u.s is very clear there's a single family segment and there's a multi-family segment so the multi-family is anything that's if it's for rent they're they're they're, they're called apartments if they're for sale and they're in a large building they're called condos but in that market where you have these buildings that can be you know anything from fifty thousand square feet to four hundred thousand square feet that's where off-site construction really takes off because in those situations they can't rent or sell any one of the units until the whole building is complete so the cycle time becomes critically important and the cycle time costs on those jobs are usually extremely high relative to an individual single family home so what we have found is that where the the low hanging fruit of offsite construction in the US has been in the whole area of these multifamily projects because there is I mean there's a a recent job that I was involved in where the builder the developer himself we we shortened the cycle time from 45 weeks to 14 weeks so the builder we asked him how much is that worth to you because this is the way we were actually i can tell you this we were a hundred thousand dollars more expensive for that project when we quoted it and we asked him how long is it going to be your stick frame going to take and he said 45 weeks and we said we think we can do it in 14. how much is that worth to you to be fair to him he came back and he told us he said it's worth if you can do it in 14 weeks it's worth six hundred thousand dollars to me and so we put the proposal to him that if we can do it in 14 weeks that we split the six hundred thousand dollars he keeps three hundred thousand and he writes us a check a bonus for three hundred thousand which means we'll get paid two hundred thousand dollars more than we initially bid for it and he wrote the check we did it in 14 weeks the second phase of that project which is now ongoing as we speak at this moment in time we didn't even have to competitively bid it project was awarded to us because he saw the advantage of it and there's a third one of that to be actually to start at the end of at the end of this year so once you get them onto the system and they see the, the value coming through then it becomes relatively relatively easy to continue to sell it but it's where where it's much easier is in that whole area of the multi-family projects because the, the cycle the cycle time costs are so large the benefits of uh of technology is something that i harp on about in, in my day-to-day um just on, on the technology point, some of the team are here, aren't they? You, you've got all, yeah, yeah. There's sixty. In Techra has sixty people in Monaghan. So my hometown, the, 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 that's the, the whole core of that of that uh, factory in in California is all based in Monaghan. I mean, that's where the that's where the intellectual property is. That's where the technology is. I mean, okay, there's sorry, there's 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 manufacturing technology on the factory floor in California, but it's actually sixty people in Monaghan who are driving that automation. Designers, send, engineers, that type of stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They send the CNC files from Monaghan, Ireland, to California to manufacture homes for California. And it's incredible when you think about it. Mm-hmm. But there's technology and there's there's you know modern day technology. But there's also what I, going back to what I said to you earlier on, Kieran, about the level of knowledge and experience that people who are in the offsite industry in Ireland have is actually world class. And actually, maybe many of the Irish people who are buying homes don't realise how good the timber frame companies in Ireland actually are. I mean, they're, they are literally world class. Let me ask you this then. So, so some of the major companies, and we've actually, we've actually dealt with a few of them, and you're right, world class operators, no question. You've got, you said 60 with designers, engineers here. So we've, we, we've got a modular workforce in place. The technology that you're using, I think you mentioned German quality, uh, you know, the actual CNC, is it, we can get them. And then the workforce, obviously, there's got, there has to be a dramatic re- reducing labor. And we're in a housing crisis. Let me ask you this one then. Why are we not pumping modular housing out? Uh, well, I suppose we're, I mean, 
Oh God. Well, let me, let me let me put that in context as well. Like when when I started a Century Homes back in Ireland in nineteen ninety, the actual number was two percent of the housing market was timber house. Two percent. Right. The latest the latest figures that were released there uh, a month ago. Now that it's sort of I, I don't know I haven't delved deep into it, but I, what they were released was. 48% of all low-rise housing in Ireland, which I think means anything under three-storey, is now being built timber frame in Ireland. So it has gone from 2% to 48%. But yes, it's still there's still a long way to go to get it up. If you think of Scotland's at 84%, I mean, think about that. Our nearest neighbour, the nearest country to us, Scotland, 84%. And, and I think everybody would say the weather in Scotland is slightly worse than the weather we have in Ireland. 84% of the homes there are built using timber frame construction. So there's a, there's a lot of potential still to, to go. But I think a lot of it, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, I suppose, and, and there's still a lot of, as I said before, the facts don't back it up, but there's still a lot of prejudice out there um, in among certain people within the construction industry. But that's because they're, they're uneducated, ignorant, and haven't bothered to find out the facts. And they hold on to it, and a lot of it is just pure emotion. I mean, I refer to to people in in in, uh, in Ireland over the years as, you know, there are those who are open minded who are willing to listen to the facts, and then the, there are the blockheads, and a, a blockhead, it doesn't matter what you say, you can bring all the scientific proof in the world to that person, it's not going to change their mind because they're a blockhead, and I'm not saying that derogatory, that's just the way they are, and I used to say to our sales guys, forget about it, don't waste your time, you're wasting my company's money by going to try to sell to them because you're not going to change them no matter what you tell them. That's just the way they are, and a generation will have to pass before there will be any change among, among those people. So that's one problem. And then the other problem, I think, is um, whilst inside a lot of the, uh, the, the timber frame companies and the offset companies, there's a lot of knowledge, unfortunately, there's a, a lack of knowledge among a lot of the people who use them. And I, I, know, I, mean, I don't want to go into an awful lot of detail, but I mean, there was a there's been a couple of classic instances in Ireland where local authorities went out and uh, ordered modular homes, and let's just say I'm not going to say they were a disaster, but it didn't turn out as well as everybody expected. But when you actually analyse what went on, the people who were in procurement didn't even know what they were procuring, and they didn't even understand the system. They didn't understand what needed to be done in advance. They didn't under understand the upfront work that had to be carried out in order to take advantage of the system. So. It was not a fault of actually the modular companies themselves. It was actually a fault of the lack of knowledge on behalf of the people who were procuring it who didn't even know what they were getting. But unfortunately, that goes back, and it always lands back on the modular company or the offset company. But in reality, the problem started with the people who were actually going out to procure it. Because to get the advantage of offset construction requires two things. It requires competence and knowledge on behalf of the offsite company and it requires competence and knowledge on behalf of the person procuring it. You can't do it with just one because that's only half of the solution. And that's where we're in Ireland, I think, the, the, you know, this housing crisis that we have at the moment when people look at at, uh, at the use of increased use of modular construction or offsite construction, a lot of the problem there is not the fact that the companies themselves don't have the capability to produce it, they do. The problem lies with the people who are procuring it. That they don't know what they're procuring. They're not educated enough, and they're still holding on to their old ways of doing things. And you know, you know, somebody said that you know the seven most dangerous words in the English language are "that's the way we've always done it." Yeah. Well, what industry will you hear that in more than any other industry? The construction industry. Deal, deal with it every day, every day. Do you find Absol absolutely? Do you find it's, yourself, Gary? We, we've uh, I, we've been connected on for a while on LinkedIn, and I often keep an eye on your posts going out and. It often feels like you, you're, you know, you're pushing, you're trying to educate, you're pushing, you're pushing. Do you often feel like you're banging ahead sometimes, like that there's just a certain element of this market that's going to buy in to what we're doing? And it, does that frustrate you? No, no, I mean, no, not at all. Because maybe because I've been at it for so long, Karen, that I that I know that, and I, and I have that grit, I have that belief. Again, probably from my dad was, <laughs> it's him that said that first to me. Was, Rome wasn't built in the day, so. What you have to do is keep at it. I mean, and my other great mantra is persistence beats resistance. So if, as you quite rightly said, you'll find that I, I say a lot of the same things over and over and over and over again. 
which is to try to get the message through. And the more you say it with more additional proof, the hope that people will say, ah, maybe I am being a little bit unreasonable here. And maybe I should look a little bit more deeply into this. And so I keep repeating the message to hope that it gets across. And my experience is, is that it does. So I, I don't get frustrated at it at all. I mean, if I, if I, again, if I look at Century Homes from 2% market share to the time that, that uh, when we sold it to Kingspan, Woodframe at that point in time was up 30% market share. So I've seen markets change and they will continue to, to change. If I have a frustration at all in Ireland, it's that the companies themselves, I think, again, have fallen back into the trap of keeping their heads low and not going out and fighting the fighting the good battle out in the out in the open, and um, because without doubt, and categorically without doubt, timber frame construction is by far the best way to build a home. If you ever lived in one of them, you would understand it's the best home you can live in. So there is no scientific reason not to build a wood frame home. In fact, it's the other way around. If you want to help protect the planet. That's actually what you should be doing. So when I when when I look at what's happening in Ireland, guys, get out there and shake the trees and get the message across to people. That's sort of what frustrates me more than anything else. Not the fact that I'm dealing with people who are not willing to listen to the answers. More, I'm more frustrated at the fact that the industry itself is not getting out there and driving the message uh, harder, uh, both to the both to the the builders and the and the home purchasers, but also to you know. To the regulators, and that's you know to 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 the to the government bodies who have a lot of influence in all of this. Now, there's been a lot of change since the time that I was dealing with it with the Department of the Environment. In fact, where you know, there, you know, I showed it in RTE. I mean, I, I found a document under the Freedom of Information Act from the Department of the Environment. Now, think about this: a Department of the Environment document that actually said that the Department of the Environment was recommending not increasing insulation standards on homes in Ireland. Now, think about this now. In a, in a, given that what's happening in Ukraine, not increasing insulation standards in Irish houses because of the negative impact it would have on the transport industry. That that was that was a document on a freedom of information file that I found. We showed it in RTE. I went to I went to the lawyers in Dublin and said to me, you should take that to the European Court. But I was at that point in time I was I was leaving um to, to go to the US. But that's the kind of thing we were dealing with uh, at that mm. point in time. Now that has changed. I mean and to a large degree you, know, you see the Green Party have, have their, their approach is much more pragmatic and realistic and, and, and looking at all types of systems and how can you improve it. So, But I still think there, there are people below them, the real government, who, the civil servants who are there every single day and every, they have been there for 10, 15 years, they really need still to have the message driven to them. There is nothing wrong with this. In fact, it's the other way around. That's the point I would make. Say. It's not that there's nothing wrong with it. It's actually, no, this is better. This is better. And I, I can tell you a story about a, a, a builder in Clean in County Kildare. I'll, I'll not name him. I, 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 I sell him today. I'd still be having friend, I'd still be having a drink with him. But I remember back in the early days of Century Homes, I drove up onto a job site in Clean County Kildare, and it was a wet Monday morning, and it was bucketing out of the heavens, absolutely bucketing out of the heavens. And I I, uh, I walked up onto this job site looking for the builder, and he was down a hole, literally down a hole. And I went up to him and I said to him, would you ever think about, you know, building these homes out of a timber frame construction? And he looked up at me out of the hole and he said, would you ever F off? And I went, okay, bad day. Now, I subsequently discovered the problem was he bought that site and part of the site was on a, on a landfill. And he was, it was costing him a fortune to try to find, found, find foundations. But I subsequently met him at a trade show about, oh, about a year later. He remembered me and I remembered him and I were I had the same conversation. And he said to me, he says to me, so you tell me why I should build timber frame. And I said, I tell you what, you tell me why you shouldn't. All right. And that was the end of the conversation. So about six years later, I get a phone call from my receptionist in Monaghan. And he said, Jerry, there's a guy, a builder on here from Clean. He says he knows you. Um, he, he wants to speak to you. And I recognized the name. So yeah, put him on. And he said to me, he said, Jerry, you know, do you remember that conversation we had at that trade show where um, I, I asked you about uh, why I should build him a frame and you told me, and you tell me why you shouldn't? He said, I've thought about it. I can't figure out a reason why I shouldn't. 
And he, well, I went down literally that week and we signed up for his next development. And we continued to supply him for 10 years after that. But that was a man who thought. He literally stopped and thought, why am I thinking this? And that's the important part. Because when you actually get the builders or the people involved to actually really think, and when they put their prejudice up, ask them for the proof. Ask them for the actual proof. Because one, 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 the the one of the biggest kickbacks you hear a lot of commentary out there is it just comes down to cost. Like, have we actually figured out a way to make this a cheaper option? And people always, it always comes down to cost, doesn't it? I mean, what, what, what what's your thoughts there in, in terms of actually a cost per build? Well, I'll give I'll give you I'll give you another story then on, on, on that. So one one of them, one of the largest customers that I had um, and had over the years was a was a builder in uh, in Port Leash. Probably one of the biggest builders in Port Leash. People can figure out who he is very easily. And I was sitting down um, for having Christmas a Christmas uh, lunch with him, and he said to me, "We were telling me, saying Jerry, he said I can't figure out why." He said, at face value, this should be costing much me more to use timber frame at face value. He says, but all I know is at the end of the year, I know I make more money using the system. All right? Now, th this is what it comes back to. Back to the point I'm going here is there's a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding among builders in terms of first cost versus total cost. So what they do is they look at the first hard, they look at the all the, we mean by first cost, all the hard costs. And it's just go back as they refuse or are incapable of actually looking at total costs. So what does the whole building with getting that whole when you include overheads and everything onto that whole project? And if I can shorten those overheads, what does that do to my cost? None of them want to talk about that. They just want to talk about the first cost. But as a as a um a consultant over here, Scott Sudam says, and he's a great expression, he says, if you only ever look at your first costs you'll never know what your total costs are. Or he actually goes on to say, says, if you only ever look at your first cost, you'll never know what your real costs are. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of, it, I would like call it, it, it stupidity. It, like it trickles down, doesn't it? You'd, Im you'd imagine when you start getting into the trades then and the trades are starting to put the price together on, on anything really that got, that's coming in after that, four, six plumbing, electrical, anything like that. These guys should be looking at the price a bit sharper, knowing what they're coming into in terms of the quality of the bill. You'd imagine it should, and, and I guess I guess that's where that's where you're getting to in terms of total cost. It's trying to calculate everything related to the bills and, and all. Yeah, but I want to. Yeah, but I want to go back to one other point here. Right, this, this, this point. So tell me this then. I take your point where some people say it costs more. So why do the builders who are using it and have been using it for the last 10, 15, 20, 30 years continue using it? Is that because they like losing money, or have they figured it out? What about this right. one? What about this one, Jerry? What no, but, no what? There, there, but there's my question is, so so no, when people say that, so all of these other guys, including some of the, currently the largest home builders in Ireland who are actually buying up timber frame companies, they're doing it because it costs more money. I mean, think about how ridiculous that is. So who's right and who's wrong? The guy who's actually done his costs and figured out, actually, I'm going to buy a timber frame company and set them up because I realize they can make money. Or the guy who says, oh, no, I got a price of that. No, that doesn't look right. That's more expensive. I'm not going to use it. Who's right? Who do you believe? So there's there's an awful lot. Of, there is an awful lot of rubbish put out there by people. And again, put the facts on the table. Let's look at the whole. Let's take a whole project and figure out the whole way through it. At the end of that project, do you make more money or do you make less money? When you factor in time savings. You factor in overheads, not just first cost. Because what, what a lot of these builders, the only simple cost they do is they substitute one leaf of block work for a leaf of timber frame. They say, oh, that's more expensive. Mm. And they don't factor in anything else that the system brings them. They don't even factor in the reduced waste. They don't even factor in the fact that over a period of time they'll have reduced warranty, which has also been proven by the NHTC in the UK. So none of these things get included into it. It's just a, a very simplistic childish way to look at costing is it in your opinion inevitable that this is going to happen anyway and what i'm getting at here is in terms of labor apprentice numbers are down not just here the uk is down the us i'm sure i read a report there that globally attracting young talent into construction is an issue is it going to be where we don't end up with a choice here where we just don't have the labor force to, to build traditionally anymore 
Well, that's certainly going to that's certainly the way it's going to be in the U.S. That is without doubt. I mean, the U.S. currently is short approximately four hundred to six hundred thousand people to work in construction. Now, think about that as a number. At the, at the current rate of attrition, for every one person who joins the U.S. construction industry, five are retiring. The five who are retiring are five skilled people who have been in the industry for 20, 30 years. The one guy who's joining has no experience. So when people talk about the fact that there's a labor shortage within the construction industry, certainly in the U.S., and I believe this will translate to Europe as well, it's, you're, only beginning, you're only seeing the beginnings of it now. Like this is not the labor shortage. Like, you know, this, is only the, this is only the starting point. So if you were to go five, 10 years from now, this situation is going to be absolutely dramatically worse than it currently is. And a lot of this that I put down to is if you think about a young person nowadays who goes out there, comes out, even if he even if he goes out of high school, so I haven't gone to college, he's out of high school, and they're, they've grown up with an iPhone in one hand and an iPad in the other, and you show them a job site out in the cold and the wind and the rain and ask them to pick up concrete blocks or swing a hammer, and they can go down the road and work for Amazon or Google in some air conditioned or you know heated building out of way from the from the from the elements for pretty much the same money. What do you think they're going to do? They're just you, you can't attract them in because they, they they're just not they've gone past that. It's 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 it, the, the, the I'm not saying I am and I'm not saying it's good or it's right that that's what's happened. I'm just facing reality. That's just what has happened. There's very few people coming out of out of out of school today who actually say, "I want to be out in the cold and the wind and the rain and the wet, swinging a hammer or lifting a concrete block." They just don't want to do it. So you're faced with what with what the Irish did many years ago, which was they went off to these other countries, and did that kind of work. They went to the UK, they went to Australia, they went to the United States. Now, if we're going to want, if we're going to have to, we're going to have to bring people in to do it, or we change what we're doing. Because if you also look at, and I would encourage people to go look at this, the McKinsey report on reinventing construction through productivity. If you look at the construction industry, and did, most people, this will shock people, but construction productivity has declined over the last 60 years. Declined. Agricultural productivity has increased by 1,750%. Manufacturing productivity has, imp has improved by 400%. But construction productivity has declined. So when then when you look at, well, how can that possibly be? It's very simple. You look at the amount of technology that's been applied to these other industries, and you look at the amount of technology that's been applied to physical construction, and you'll see there's virtually zero. So you're getting less skilled people coming into the industry, and you're not applying modern technology to the industry. What do you think is going to happen? All of these other industries are doing it, and their productivity is improving. But the consequence of that is you get less houses built, which means means these things costs go up and affordability becomes an issue. So the fact that builders are holding on to old ways of doing things, old methodologies and processes, is actually driving up costs, which is making homes more unaffordable. So it's actually a vicious circle. If you want to increase the quality and improve the profit, the the uh, the affordability of homes, then you need to increase productivity. So the question, Kieran, shouldn't be asked about what do we do. This genuinely, this is what I said. The question should be reframed as: It's not what do we do to increase the the amount of labor there is. What should we do to increase the amount of productivity there is? In other words, how can we get the people who are in the industry not to work harder? but to work smarter, or not even, that's not even right. I don't want to say to work smarter, but how do we unshackle them from old ways of doing things and allow them to use modern technology so they can produce more, and actually ironically produce more in a safer way at a higher quality? That's how we drive down costs. So the, the, the whole question has been, has been framed the wrong way. It's always, well, how do we get more labor? How do we get more labor? Like in, in no other industry, even including the timber frame industry, when you want to increase your output in a factory, if you're if you're a manufacturer of timber of timber frame homes, and you want to increase your output, you're looking at technology as being your first route to try to do that. How can I put in a new machine to increase my productivity? How can I change my processes uh, around so that I can actually increase productivity? When do you ever hear that on a job site? Mm. No, I need more people. 
everything's just simply oh no you throw more you throw more hands at it that's how you increase it that drives up costs lowers productivity and makes homes more unaffordable the answer is a productivity increase so when you focus on that then you ask you start to ask the right questions about how do i increase productivity it's not how do i increase the amount of labor how do i increase the amount of productivity and that's what will drive the industry towards more off-site or industrialized uh, construction solutions. Gary, I'm being grateful of your time and I'm just watching time here, so I'm, I'm gonna keep us with, with, within the time we've allocated. Where can people learn more about yourself and Tecra? Where, where, where can they go to find out more? Right, I, I have my own consultancy business called offsitetech.com, O-F-F-S-I-T-E-T-E-K. Dot com and Integra his website is is integra.com which is e n t e k r a dot com but I would also suggest to everybody else and I says go look at kingspansentry.com go look at signum.com go look at or signum.ie go look at look at ijm timber engineering look at look at what you have in Ireland I mean and I'm 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 sort of very proud to say that you know my family's been involved in, in offsite construction for sixty years from IJM through Century through Integra, you know we, we have a long legacy in in this industry. I'm saying that not because I'm 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 saying that more to the fact is this works, this is the solution, and no matter how you look at it, this is where the industry needs to go. And it, within Ireland, you have some great companies. Gary, we leave it at that on a positive note. Thank you very much, uh, and we will link up them couple of links in the in, in, in the show notes. Gary, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Kieran. It was a pleasure. Condom Materials is brought to you by LiveCost, the construction software fully designed to manage your construction financial forecasts. Visit LiveCost.com to take a product tour, or reach out to our team of construction cost experts to transform your project profits. Any links mentioned during this episode, including speaker profiles or any other resources, are available on the podcast show notes. Your feedback is also welcome. We would really appreciate it if you could take a moment to leave us a review or email your comments, guest suggestions to hello at timeandmaterials.com. Finally, if you haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for listening. Until next time, I'm your host, Kieran Brennan.